But <clears throat> first, we're going to talk about uh, the skeleton in general and bone tissue. What does this? What is the skeleton good for? Please enlighten me, somebody. Yeah. Okay. So. Blobs of tissue, yeah, yeah, sort of. I didn't quite go there in the meditation today, but we were heading there. We're just getting heavy and not having any structure. So, right, support. What else? Can anybody else tell me something else that the skeleton uh, is, is? So I haven't, this word here is plural. Clearly I have something beyond just support in mind. What's that? So protection, is that what you were going to say, Jensen? It makes blood. Yes, absolutely it makes blood. Thank you. And it does uh, protect the organs like our head. So protection, you guys uh, are right. She was jumping ahead of me a little bit. Um, we use it for movement as well, right? So the muscles act on our bones, and the skeleton are, acts as the levers uh, that drive movement. Um, are there any others? I don't remember what the list, the order of the list here. Oh, look at you guys. That's amazing. That's remarkable. <laughs> Acid, base. Acid base balance. Okay, so there we go. Um, yeah, these are the, the functions of, of support, uh, protection for the cranium, the viscera, and the chest, thoracic viscera, they act as levers for movement, and electrolyte balance. So for example, calcium, we'll talk about calcium homeostasis, acid base balance, we're not going to go into that at all. Uh, we'll have one incredibly very light uh, glancing blow at the formation of blood. So here are the types of bones. Somebody had been asking me for um, the, some takeaways from the slides to help focus your attention. So I, I I'm trying to convey in these slides. But uh, these are the types of bones. There's six. Um, morphologic categories, six structural categories, six forms of bone, right? Uh, and these are, there are flat bones. There are flat bones. For example, flat bones of our skull, thin, long. Uh, there are long bones. Long bones are the ones that we think of, of the most, right? Your arm bone, your shin bone, your thigh bone, uh, those, those Long uh, bones, particularly. Uh, there are sutural bones. Eh, not really to us, but the little bone stuck in the suture. There are irregular bones, uh, the bones that we don't know where, how, or where to categorize them uh, because they have very strange shapes, and the most important of these to us uh, are the vertebrae. Um, if there's a long bone, why do we call it a long bone if there's not going to be a short bone? So, the short bone. Short bones, for example, would be the carpal bones, the bones of your wrist. They're, they're short, they're kind of honestly the shape of a sort of uh, wonky sphere. Short. Uh, roundish bone. And then there are these things called sesamoid bones. Uh, sesamoid bones. There are a couple constant sesamoid bones. Uh, the largest of them is the patella. A sesamoid bone uh, is a bone that is embedded inside the body of a tendon. All right, so the patella, your kneecap, is embedded in the tendon of the rectus femoris bone. Right? That tendon from your your quadriceps goes down and inserts on the tibia, and uh, the patella is inside that tendon and gives a mechanical advantage. Another sesamoid bone is the pisiform bone. So if you take your wrist 
and, and you flex the wrist and you go to the pinky side of it, the medial side, you'll feel that there's a bone right there in the very corner of, of your palm. You can move that around. That's called the pisiform bone. That's another sesamoid bone that gives you, it's on the anterior side right here. Yeah, yeah, if you unflex the wrist, you can move it around. You have to really, yeah, like, yeah, you can move it around. It's your pisiform bone. It's another sesamoid bone. Uh, there are other sesamoid bones that happen inconstantly in the body. Like, maybe Molly has one, but Priya doesn't. And they're called sesamoid because they're very tiny, the size of a sesame seed that sometimes form inside the body of a tendon. Well, sesamoid bones are bones that, by definition, exist within the body of a tendon. Uh, and sometimes a person's tendon calcifies. The connective tissue there will calcify, and it'll form a little bone in that tendon. And sometimes they do nothing. Maybe they can be a problem. Maybe they can give you a mechanical advantage, which probably will not impact your ability to procreate and pass that on necessarily in the gene pool, but who knows, okay? So, says Molly Bowen. The important ones for us. Uh, okay. So, marrow. Um, there is red marrow and there is uh, yellow marrow. Did I, did I not point out the contrary? Uh, there are different types of bones classified by form. That's the takeaway. That not all bones are the same. There are different types of bones. They're classified by their form. And what did we say at the beginning of the year? That uh, form ever follows function. So if there are different forms of bone, they're going to serve different functions. And that's going to be a theme that we're going to expand upon. That's, that's the real point here. I don't need you to know exactly what but that there are different bones uh, morphologically, and, and that reflects the different functional uh, characteristics that these bones have. You got, got the point? So uh, this is going to uh, continue that theme, uh, and we're going to do that simply by talking about marrow, just for a moment, uh, picking up on Jensen's point that bones don't make blood. Uh, we have two types of marrow, red and yellow marrow. Uh, red marrow is for the production of, of blood, what's called erythropoiesis is the medical term for that. Uh, it's just red cell production. And then yellow marrow is uh, fat storage. It's a form of fat storage. It becomes fat. Uh, so in infants, a little child, they look a lot like cute when they're, when they're skeleton. Um, they... <laughs> They are essentially entirely red marrow, okay? And then as you grow, uh, the, the appendicular skeleton, by and large, shifts towards yellow marrow, whereas the axial skeleton and a few of the, uh, the proximal regions of the appendicular skeleton retain the red marrow in them, all right? Um, does anyone want to guess why this may be? They're growing, and they need blood. Yeah, they do. That's right. They need blood cells, so they're, they're in. Uh, uh, and, and if you also just kind of look at the amount in here of red marrow, it's actually not dramatically different. Uh, looking at a bone, here's a, an example of a left femur. Uh, and when we look at those bones, about, uh, so a bone in general is made of uh, dense bone or compact bone or cortical bone. Those are all synonyms. And uh, spongy bone or cancellous bone. Those are synonyms. About three quarters of the weight is dense and quarter is spongy. And we'll see what I mean by that in a moment. But uh, I'm not talking about fat. 
this will all be compact. Area here, spongy stuff would be the cancellous. We'll see what that means. But, anyways, the point is as bones vary by form, they also vary by function. Actually, yeah. Know how much they weigh? What do you mean? Like, oh, yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, I, I think the important concept here is that uh, there is compact and spongy bone, and compact bone, by virtue of it being dense bone, is going to represent a larger portion of the weight of the, uh, the bone. So what that's setting me up to talk about the strength of a bone and the relative contribution to the weight of the bone. Yeah, the exact number for the number's sake is not what I'm thinking about, but I am going to make a point with that. So, um, here is uh, a cutaway of a section of a long bone, and we see this uh, this compact bone uh, right here. We we've gone through this anatomy in the lab, so I'm not going to belabor it. I just have to point out a few things that. In these concentric lamella, we have there are layers of collagen that are striped through that. But uh, then transitioning from that circumference of the bone towards uh, the center of the bone, or the deeper in the bone, we transition from this dense cortical bone to this cancellous bone, the spongy bone. And what is spongy bone? Well, it turns out that there are these little spicules, or what we call uh, trabeculae, uh, of, of bones that are kind of in this, this meshwork. I don't know a good word to describe what that looks like. Um, but the word uh, is related to the word uh, tribulation. So a trial and a tribulation is a tribulation is like a twisted, difficult path, and uh, the the trabeculae is this complex, twisted network of tiny little needle bones that are all in this web, thin, very strong uh, bone in the center. Questions here. So, okay. So let's look at uh, spongy bone. Why, why have spongy bone? Why not just have all dense bone? Why not we? Why don't? Why isn't the bone just like solid where it needs to be strong? Well, <clears throat> uh, turns out that spongy bone gives you remarkable strength. Gives you remarkable uh, mechanical strength with minimal weight, which is ideal because we have less to move around. It's kind of nicer to be light, right, uh, and strong. And when we actually look at, we look at the uh, pattern of spongy bone, the trabeculae that get laid down in the bone, there are these uh, patterns of, of trabeculae that match lines of mechanical stress. So somehow the body is laying down uh, trabeculae, modeling the bone tissue to uh, be optimally supportive of the kinds of, uh, in the face of the kinds of uh, physical tasks that we're asking our body to do, right? And this isn't just in the head of the femur. So you can see here uh, are some examples of the kinds of mechanical stress that you can have. Here's weight bearing uh, lines of stress, uh, muscular lines of stress, so the muscle pull. There's different pulls and pushes on these lines of stress. And you can see pathways of trabeculae that mirror these lines of stress, and not just in the head, but going down throughout uh, the body. So the question, the questions that arise are, how does this happen? 
And does yoga affect this? If it does, how does yoga affect this? All right? That's, that's what I want to know. How does this happen? How is the body laying down these patterns of bone? And does it just happen normally? Is that like super wired into the DNA? Is there like a, like a, like a photograph and there's these little guys down there with the, the blueprints? How is this happening? What's actually happening? Uh, and and uh, how is yoga affecting this? Does this relate to yoga? Well, the answer is yes. All right. So, um, I'm going to give you the answer, and then we're going to go into the details of how, uh, what that, what that means. So, um, these are the effects of yoga and other weight-bearing exercises. I don't want to pretend that yoga is the only way to affect bone density because it's not. It's not. But um, it along with a whole host of other types of weight-bearing activities, is, uh, is capable of remodeling your bone. And this is through what's called mineral recycling. Mineral recycling is going to allow our bones to adapt to the stresses that are, are put on them. And we're going to see uh, what mineral recycling even means. Uh, there's the observation that heavily stressed bones become uh, thicker and stronger. Not just thicker and stronger, but the uh, patterns of spongy bone, of cancellous bone that gets laid down specifically reflects the kinds of stresses that the bone is subject to. Um, and then there are, other, there are other aspects. We'll get into more in subsequent lectures. But uh, yoga obviously reduces stress, uh, but as it reduces stress, it's going to also dial down any kind of associated inflammatory hormones uh, like cortisol that uh, are going to interfere with bone regeneration. So the higher your cortisol is, the lower your bone uh, recycling rate is. We don't want that. We'll talk about that in the next lecture. But, uh, and then yoga, of course, supports postural health for ideal alignment. Uh, so that we are uh, using gravity to our best effect, right? Instead of like, like this or whatever people do with themselves, which can distort their body, uh, yoga helps you to be aware of uh, your carriage, how you, how you stack your bones, and prevents by preventing skeletal collapse, and spinal compression, okay? So, uh, and let's just see uh, very phenomenologically what this means here. So when a skeletal muscle, here's our, our bicep and medialis, when it's pulling on a bone, all right, uh, it pulls on that bone and causes the bone to, be, to rebuild itself, to remodel itself, denser and thicker, right where that muscle is pulling on the bone. Whoa, how does that happen? I mean, it's fine for me to tell you that, that it happens, but we're going to see how that happens. Uh, if you don't do that kind of thing, if you're not using a bone, if you're not, uh, if that bone is not bearing weight, either via a compression or a muscle pulling on it, the bone mass can be lost uh, very rapidly. So you can lose, depending upon the specifics of your individual physiology and what bone and what and the exact context, as much as a third of a bone of bone mass, peak bone mass, can be lost uh, in just a fortnight of inactivity. So, yeah, that's that's pretty rapid, actually. It's a pretty rapid loss of bone density, and the, and the idea is just if you don't need it, you lose it. Don't use it, you lose it. Okay, so let's begin to die. Yes, Molly. Yeah, that's a good question, like the kinetics of... I, that is going to be dependent upon a number of factors. Uh, it's going to be dependent upon the, the kind of weight-bearing uh, exercise that you're using to remediate the problem. It's going to be dependent upon your age 
and your and your baseline health. It's going to be dependent upon your diet. Yeah, a bunch of things are going to affect that. Yeah, I can. I mean, it doesn't mean that in like six weeks your bone completely evaporates, right? It, that that statistic is a little misleading. Like in that first two weeks, you're gonna you can lose up to a third. So say you have you are in a or something, right? Uh, and it's not going to happen to all the bones uniformly, but uh, bones that get a lot of weight bearing, uh, continuous weight bearing. Say you were like a some sort of athlete. And then you go into like complete sedentary, uh, non-usage of that bone. It you're gonna it's gonna be an exp an exponential decay, right? So you're you're gonna have the most rapid uh, loss in the first two weeks, and that can be up to a third under certain uh, under certain circumstances. That doesn't mean everybody like you broke you break your shin, you like you go in a cast, and the bone is suddenly gonna shrink. Um, that doesn't. Mean that it's probably going to be significantly less for a healthy young individual who has a bone weakness, but you will lose some density for sure. Um, okay, on to how this works. So, some more anatomy. I don't remember how much uh, I did with the periosteum in the bone in the lab. You remind me. Did I did I even use that word? Periosteum. Uh, you guys don't remember. Well, uh, the periosteum is just peri just means on the outside of something, and osteum means of the layer. It's the membranous layer on the outside of a bone. Osteon is the Greek word. The periosteum is the membrane on the outside of the bone. Uh, and the periosteum is important for a number of reasons. It's where the bone cells, uh, a lot of the bone cells live certain types of bone cells. Uh, we'll talk about which in a moment here. And particularly the bone cells that are important for remodeling of bone. Okay? So uh, we're going to go through that process of remodeling. But also, this is where the perforating fibers of a tendon uh, are going to penetrate into this fibrous layer around a bone. That's how they embed themselves in the bone. That's how a tendon actually is attached. Okay? So bones are covered in this layer, the periosteum. And there's this fibrous layer on the very outside and this inner cellular layer uh, that has these osteoblasts on them. We'll talk, we'll talk about uh, what that means in the slide. But um, so the periosteum is on the outside. And then on the inside of the bone, I guess I should, should put another little text box on the bone. Uh, talks about the uh, endosteum, but the endosteum is just another cellular layer, it's another cellular layer that's on the inside of the bone, on the marrow cavity of the bone, all right? And again, it's going to have these, these specialized bone cells that I'm going to talk about in a bit. So periosteum, endosteum, these two layers of, of bone cells that are not the osteocytes that we're so familiar with talked about the osteocytes that are embedded in the lacuna in the actual dense bone. These other bone cells, and we'll see what that means. These, these bone cells, the osteoclasts, the osteoblasts, the osteoblasts, they live either in the endosteum or the periosteum. That's where all this action is happening. Okay, so there are four bone uh, cell types. And uh, we'll cut to the chase right now. There are three bone building cells and one bone dissolving cell, one type of bone dissolving cell. Three bone building, one bone dissolving. And, and to give you a little hint, it's going to be the balance of the two types, right? It's going to be the balance of the action of one, ver one type versus the other type that's going to give us the recycling of a bone. So first, the bone building cells. Uh, there are these osteoprogenitor cells, which then can become, they differentiate. They're, this is a type of stem cell. It's a type of stem cell 
It's not like an embryonic stem cell, which can turn into anything. It was one of those at one point in time, but it's begun to differentiate. It's begun to take on some characteristics to the point where it's still a stem cell, but it can, it's only ever going to become an osteoid. Okay, that, that's where it's headed. Uh, so the next step in development is to go from osteo, an osteoprogenitor cell or an osteoblast. An osteoblast. And then osteoblasts, if needed, can become osteocytes. And we've talked about osteocytes already. So first, uh, the osteoprogenitors. Uh, really, they're just there to get called up if needed. If we need more osteoblasts, those osteoprogenitor cells, they are the only ones that are able to go through mitosis, all right? They're the only ones that can go through mitosis and proliferate. None, none of these other cell types can prol proliferate. They can't split and become more of them. But the osteoprogenitor cells can. That's really their job, is if we need more bone cells, they, they divide, and then some of them can develop into the osteoblasts. The job of the osteoblast um, is that it's going to produce the organic matrix, which is called the osteoid. So remember in areolar tissue, we called the matrix uh, like ground substance. And in cartilage, uh, we didn't really give it a name. We just called it matrix. Um, and we said that it was like the, the, in those slides, the purple stuff in between uh, the lacuna. And in bone, we call this matrix osteoid. And we're going to see what osteoid's made of because it turns out to be important to understand how yoga impacts density. But uh, Osteoblast job is to lay down, is to create osteoid, all right? And uh, it can then mineralize osteoid uh, along with osteocytes. Some, some osteoblasts can turn into osteocytes, all right? Say this osteoblast finds itself surrounded by osteoid, and it's getting the cues, the environmental cues that are being provided by stresses that we're putting on the bone. Uh, it's getting the cues to turn that osteoid into, uh, into dense bone, to mineralize it, to lay down the calcium and phosphate. We'll see what that looks like in a minute. So then, lastly, the osteocyte, really, its job is to, is to further mineralize it and to maintain uh, the structure of that dense bone. So osteoblasts are building up new bone. And then on the other hand, we have osteoclasts. Oh, it's so difficult having two words so similar. B, blast, build, osteoclast, C, C, clast, corrode. Yeah, so the osteo B, blast, bone building cells, uh, are sort of opposite to the osteo C class corroding cells, the cells that dissolve bone. Their job, like I've just said, is to dissolve bone. They break down dense bone. They dissolve uh, the, the matrix and the minerals in the dense bone. So let's, let's look at how this works. On one hand, bone remodeling. Uh, happens throughout life, about 10% of the mass of your skeleton gets turned over every year. About 10% every year. Chances are there's very little of the actual bone material in your body that was in your body when you were born at this point. Right? You guys have gone through 18 years of bone recycling. Um, and 
all of this remodeling happens due to the combined action of the osteoclasts, which are going to dissolve bone away, and then the osteoblasts, which build it up anew, which build it up anew. All right. You'll notice that this happens um, via signaling by cytokines. We talked about cytokines at the end of last lecture, hormones that call cytocell kine kinetic motion. Cytokines are hormones that put a cell into motion, make it do something. All right, there, it's, a, it's a general category of hormone that's going to make a cell do what it's supposed to do. It's going to put that cell in, in, into action. And the cell, uh, the, the cytokine that's important for regulating this, I'm only pointing this out because we just talked about it, uh, is a tissue growth factor beta 1, which was the same cytokine that we uh, discussed in the areolar tissue. Uh, areolar or connective tissue in the rats, the fascia. So bone is also a uh, type of connective tissue, and these bone cells are use the TGF beta one signaling pathway to mediate uh, their response. Okay, so let's get to bone matrix. A very tiny percentage, less than 2% of your bone, is actually made up of the osteoclast, blast, or cells, whatever. That's only about 2% of the actual bone tissue. The rest of your bone's not actually alive. It's not actually a living thing. 98 plus percent of your bone is just this like thing that's inside of you, that these little cells are maintaining. So about a third of it is made up of organic matter. This is dry weight, dehydrated. Take the drink. And this is going to get made by the osteoblasts, because we said that the osteoblasts build osteoid the matrix. All right? Um, this is going to have collagen in it, uh, and then a, a bunch of these carbohydrate protein complexes. And I talked a little bit about that last time, didn't I? I talked about uh, the glycosaminoglycans, the hyaluronic acid, the uronic acid, the anions that repel one another, and they carbohydrates and proteins together. But there's a bunch of them. There's glycosaminoglycans, proteoglycans, and there's glycoglycans. So a bunch of carbo carbohydrate protein complexes, but importantly, there's collagen. Importantly, there's collagen. And this is what is going to make that bone. Um, we, we, we think about bones as like these rock-solid things, but they're not actually rocks. They're, they're actually a little bit flexible, much more flexible than a rock. They, they can bend a little bit. They shouldn't bend a lot. Uh, but they, they have some flexibility, so they're not utterly brittle. Uh, and it's this collagen that imparts that, uh, that small amount of flexibility. The other two-thirds of the bone is a ceramic crystal, which I find to be uh, a beguiling thought for that. That much of our body mass is actually just a ceramic crystal. We're walking around with these uh, ceramic crystals. So uh, most of that is what's called hydroxyapatite. And this is the chemical formula for the production of hydroxyapatite. You'll, you'll need to memorize that. Uh, and this is a model of of um, what it looks like. All right, it's a ceramic crystal. Uh, but you'll notice here that I, I put this up here so that you can see this what's called stoichiometry. Who's unfamiliar with that word? 
stoichiometry, is a word that describes the ratios of elements or, or uh, compounds in a chemical compound. Right? It's the ratios uh, of, of things. The, the ratio of, cal I'm going to point out the ratio of calcium to phosphate. So a lot of calcium, 10 calcium atoms for every phosphate, all right, for every phosphate. So one phosphorus for every 10 calcium. But there is a ratio there uh, that's important. Tons of calcium. They also, there's also quite a bit of calcium carbonate in there. Uh, bone. So this tough stuff, ceramics are pretty brittle. They're fairly strong. It's an amazing repository of calcium, a storage of calcium, but it's res responsible for what's called the piezoelectric effect in bones. The piezoelectric effect in bones. And this is where you're like wondering why, how did we get so far away from Tadasana uh, and the yoga to be talking about piezoelectric effect? This is where the rubber is going to meet the road, and we're actually going to be a explain how yoga and weight-bearing activity uh, impacts the density of bones. I'll have to explain that. It's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. I think it is. Hopefully you'll agree. Okay. So let's, let's recap a little bit and, and take an, another look at how all of this fits into the structure of bones. Um, so these... The organic com components, the one-third of the mass that is these uh, glycoproteins and collagen, and the two-thirds that is the hydroxyapatite and a little bit of calcium carbonate, uh, they combine and form this mineralized protein, these mineralized protein crystal particles. That's what our bones actually are, these uh, conglomerations, the mineralized protein crystal particles. Thanksgiving and have disagreement with your sibling instead of having a bone to pick. So here, here's your here's your bone with the uh, trabeculae, right? The trabecular network, the spongy panels of the bone, and the lines of stress. And this trabecular network gives uh, rise to the conspicuous. Itself has these collagen fibrils. So there's going to be this, this bundle of collagen fibers. A collagen fiber is a triple helix that then gets woven with other triple helixes and more and more like a single thread in a giant uh, hauser rope that you might see holding a ship or something, a big thick rope. That's what uh, all of this is going to be. And there are these collagen uh, fibrils are held together uh, and with these uh, mineral crystal particles, hydroxy. So here's hydroxy apatite above. I showed you a side view. And this is an electron micrograph of little particles, this uh, mineral crystal that's in our cells. All right? <clears throat> or in our bones. So all of this, this collagen fiber and inorganic uh, crystal, comes together to form the either osteons in the dense bone or the spicules in the trabecular network. And all of those go together to form a bone. All right, so let's, let's, let's keep pushing forward and see how uh, this works. The first thing I want to talk about before I get uh, back into the deep molecular of how it works, let's take another step back and just look at how bone grows. There are two types of ways of bone can grow. There's the interstitial growth. <clears throat> and this is what happens as a young person grows into adulthood, where you have that growth plate, the telogenous growth plate, that extends from the collagen fiber. Most of you at this point uh, within, like your bodies are doing it as we speak or within the next, like, Many of you, this is healing off. So 
plate and be sealing off and ossifying these large Not all of you, some of you. Uh, but once you get here, throughout life, those bones uh, go through what's called appositional growth. They can increase in width. And this is due to bone remodeling. Uh, new bone gets laid deep in here and on the outside. So bones get a little bit uh, wider in diameter with age. The osteoclasts make the, the marrow cavity larger and osteo and the, the periosteum on the outside of the bone lays down uh, lays down new bone. The bone grows in width. Yeah, Anna. Well, maybe. Um, yeah. I, perhaps that's a part of it. I, I certainly think, uh, yeah, I don't know. This, I'm, we're all speculating on anecdotal, uh, like an imaginary photo here. But, uh, you know, with time, most people, um, like their bodies, do this anyways. And so it all kind of, I don't know, they didn't gain weight necessarily, but you're body compresses and changes, right? But it's going to be part of it. The, the, so when I'm showing this, right, your bone isn't growing like, wow, that's the bone of a 45-year-old. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like super dramatic like that. The, the bone will just grow a little bit in diameter. Yeah, just grow a little bit in diameter throughout its life. So interstitial versus appositional. So let's let's get to the origin of this piezoelectricity. I should have put I should have put a, a diagram showing what piezoelectric even means. Uh, who knows what piezoelectric means? Is anybody familiar with that term at all? Yeah, I should have put a slide in there. Uh, okay, so piezoelectric is A material we're gonna we're gonna put a uh, a voltometer okay in the bowl and there's some kind of material here that's piezoelectric there's piezoelectric ceramics there's piezoelectric uh, metals uh, very common uh, not very common but it's and this voltometer uh, is showing zero there's, there's no potential there's no electricity across it charge across it. Now, in piezoelectric materials, you can compress, you can push, put a force on that material, and by distorting, maybe it's the crystalline lattice of that material. By distorting the crystalline lattice, you're going to induce a charge separation. You're going to induce a charge separation across that material. That can then be measured. All right? And it goes both ways. You can take... You can take a charge, a battery. This is just the symbol for a battery. You can put uh, a charge across this material and... It will change its shape. It will change its shape. Okay, so it goes both ways. You can compress it and induce a charge, or put a charge across it, and it will and it will spontaneously change its shape to match. Does that make sense? That's what piezoelectric. Is. And they use piezoelectric things for like what's called, for example, atomic force microscopy. Basically, tweezers, microscopic, teeny tiny tweezers that can like pick up tiny little things and move them around. It's like how they uh, gene manipulate eggs, for example, oocytes. Like, look, you know. 
Anyways, turns out our bodies are piezoelectric. The bones in our bodies are electric. <clears throat> so here's collagen. Here's a collagen fiber, and I, I meant, I was thinking about it at breakfast, I wanted to draw, wanted to put a bone in here so you know that this is the length of the bone, okay? There's your bone. And this is the bone just sitting there, no weight on it, okay? So now we're going to compress it. We're going to put some force on that bone. And when we do that, compressing it, so remember, this is just like a rope. It's spiraled like rope. If you took a length of rope, like with all those strands, and you kind of pushed it like this, you had, you had cut it off on the ends and you pushed it, it would do that. It would come untwisted a little bit, right? The like loops of it would kind of push out a little bit. But when you do that to collagen, charges that are buried inside of that strand get revealed a little bit. As you untwist a rope, as you compress it, and you can see the inside of that rope, the inside of the rope gets exposed a little bit, right? So when you compress a bone, the collagen reveals these charges that are normally hidden on the inside of this. I'm sorry I don't have a better drawing. There's certainly nothing that shows this well. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, bones are extremely strong in terms of uh, compressive force, and so you can put a lot of weight on a bone uh, along the longitudinal axis. Their uh, tensile strength is about an order of magnitude smaller, so like pulling a bone, um, but they don't have to be strong in that way. And then uh, the lateral force or the, the, the torsional force is like an order of magnitude again. So it's very easy to break a bone this, this way. Um, as to where along the length of a bone, there are certainly going to be bones that are more susceptible to breakage in one place versus another, depending upon, you know, all the circumstances, right? So, like, the head of your femur is a likely place to break a bone if you're old because people fall on their hips. Or at young people uh, break their shins a lot because they're running around and do something stupid with their legs. Or... Uh, yeah, there, there are like certain bones in, in the hand that break just because like there are common types of injuries that happen and certain bones are thinner, like just the, the shape of the bone is, is not as thick in that place as maybe another. But uh, in terms of reinforcing a bone based upon the stresses that it gets, right? So like the, the more pressure you put on a bone in a certain way, like a muscle pulling on it or compressing a bone a certain way, uh, that is going to increase the density of that bone along to, to counter that force, to support that force. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is everybody with me here so far? So you compress a bone and these charges come out. And what happens is because of the specific amino acid sequence in that collagen, it creates a dipole, a dipole, like a little magnet. Not, it's not magnetic, but it, it's like that. It's a, it's a charged dipole, not a magnetic dipole. But it's, it's a little dipole uh, that goes along the length of the collagen. Um, that dipole is going to, oops, that dipole is going to attract These osteoblasts, they like it. They're tuned into it. They're built to recognize it, and they flock to it. So here are these osteoclasts, blasts, pardon me, blasts come. They, they recognize this collagen is getting compressed. This collagen is getting stressed. All right? 
Maybe this is collagen that is in osteoid on the surface of a bone. It's getting compressed. Uh, there's these dipoles that are being induced, all right, because this material is piezoelectric. And they come in and lay down the hydroxyapatite onto that collagen and mineralize that osteoid, thus increasing bone density, thus uh, building new bone. Appetite, the hydroxy, the, the uh, inorganic component of the bone, the like ceramic, mineral ceramic stuff, the calcium in it. Yes, ma'am. You guys following this? I I so wish I had time to like make some beautiful video or or something or like a really cool graphic because the like image I have in my head of this is so incredible that like just I just imagine dancing right I just imagine like a person dancing and every part of them is invisible except their skeleton right except their skeleton and so you just see this like skeleton dancing around but Every time the like the like skeleton lands on a bone somewhere, that bone lights up and glows because of the charges that are being induced along the length of the bone. Uh, it it is genuinely creating an electric field around that bone when the bone is being used or compressed or whatever. It's just a kind of a beautiful way to think about motion in my mind. So maybe that'll work for you. I don't know. You guys following this? It's kind of cool that our, our bodies are like hardwired to be these like electrical machines that respond to these electrical crystals, mineralized uh, crystals that respond to, to motion. Um, okay. So what's the significance? Well, there's 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 a couple significant things. First is uh, it turns out that external electrical stimulation can be used to help heal and repair bone. Right? If you if you induce a charge in a bone, say you have somebody who has got like a really bad break, they're laid up, they can't use their bone, and they don't want their bone to decrease in bone density. We want to increase that bone density, but they're stuck in bed. You just you can induce uh, healing in a bone by putting an external electrical stimulation on that bone. Um, but for our purposes, weight-bearing exercise like yoga increases bone density, absolutely. The guy that first really discovered that this relationship between weight-bearing exercise and bone density was this guy, uh, Julius Wolff. He was a German physiologist at the turn of the century. And uh, these are some drawings that he made showing the lines of force. Uh, he, he mapped out the lines of force in, uh, in bones. He was, he was one of these kind of guys, kind of like, uh, what's his name? My architect, Lewis Sullivan, he was one of these guys that uh, was kind of a, a Renaissance thinker in turn, like very broad thinker. Um, he compared the structure of bone and the sort of the tensegrity of of bone, spongy bone, to like structure of various plants. Uh, he went into botany and and all other realms of biology, but he was a surgeon uh, by profession and was and was finding these like correlations, these physical, biomechanical uh, correlations. He had some pretty cool drawings. Uh, it's going. So that was, we got through that. That's cool. Uh, yoga affects bone density directly through the piezoelectric effect. Uh, but does it have any other effects on bone health? All right. So we, we talked about uh, we, you have seen in great detail now how weight-bearing activity, like yoga, is going to uh, impact bone density. Is that all that yoga is going to do for your skeleton, for example? <clears throat> well, of course, Patanjali answers 
Yes, there are other ways that uh, yoga can impact the body, and one of them, uh, the skeleton, and one of them is via calcium homeostasis. Ooh, okay, so this is going to be our first real dive into a homeostatic uh, process and how yoga relates to it. We're not going to get through all of this, but we'll, we'll, we'll start the idea. <clears throat> all right. Before I, I go on, are there any questions about any of this? Everybody's pretty solid here? Cool. So calcium homeostasis. The idea behind calcium homeostasis is how to keep the level of circulating calcium in your blood within an acceptable range. Right, it's right around uh, 10 milligrams per deciliter. I think is the reference rate, it, but that that's not important. What is important is just that uh, calcium homeostasis is keeping the circulating concentration of calcium stable. It's keeping it stable in the body, and this is going to be regulated uh, by by three hormones two groups of hormones. Uh, the first group is calcitonin. Calcitonin gets secreted when calcium is high, when you have too much calcium in your blood. Too much calcium in the blood, the thyroid is going to make calcitonin. Then the other group is parathyroid and calcitriol. Parathyroid hormone is really the one that is controlling it. Cal uh, parathyroid hormone, calcitriol is uh, subject to parathyroid. But parathyroid hormone also comes from the same region, the little parathyroid glands. And then calcitriol is made from vitamin D, which we get from the sun or from milk or from whatever. Uh, and both of these come into play calcium is low. Okay? So three hormones are going to regulate this in three tissues. And what are these tissues? Well, it's going to be in bones, the digestive tract, and the kidneys. So let's walk through why those three tissues. Bones are where we store calcium. Digestive tract is how we bring calcium into the body. And the kidneys are how we pass calcium that's been absorbed by us out of the body. All right? So those three tissues are going to be uh, very important. And specifically what happens, well, uh, calcium makes, or calcitonin makes bones store calcium. PTH and vitamin D uh, helps dissolve calcium out of your bones. Your calcium is low. When your calcium is low, PTH dissolves calcium, takes it out of storage. When calcium is high in the blood, calcitonin is going to bank it and store it. And next, uh, the effect on the digestive tract. Well, calcitonin is going to make you pass calcium that you ate out and not absorb it. It's going to pass out in the, through your feces. Maybe you drank a bunch of milk, but your calcium is high. Your calcium is high in your blood already. You have high calcium. So calcitonin is going to make it so that you don't actually absorb that calcium in your gut. It'll pass right through. PTH will be the opposite. So when your calcium, your circulating calcium is low, PTH will help you absorb calcium from the gut. And then, likewise, the kidney. Uh, calcitonin, when calcium is high, calcitonin makes it so that your kidneys excrete the calcium or eliminate some of that calcium that's in your blood. Uh, and conversely, PTH and vitamin D are going to help you retain calcium. Uh, at the kidneys and not excrete it out of the blood. So keep as much in the blood as you possibly can. All right? You know, 
the important, the most important thing here is that these hormones are coming from the thyroid and parathyroid. That's what's really crucial to my discussion with you about you. We could go into calcium homeostasis in depth, but um, the take home is going to be about the thyroid. So, for example, here is this homeostatic pathway. Here we go, blood, calcium goes up, thyroid gets into the game, produces calcitonin, helps uh, treat calcium in the kidneys, helps store calcium in the bones, and it goes back down to our septum. On the other hand, maybe our blood calcium is low. Parathyroid glands make ATH and release calcium to the bone, uh, prevents us from losing it in the urine, and activates the uptake in the gut, brings calcium back up, all right? Important thing is the thyroid and the parathyroid. We will pick up there next time.